Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, I want to try and see if we can repair this Agilent MXA Signal Analyzer. Now, this is a fairly good instrument. MXA is a quite a high-end spectrum analyzer. This is the N9020A. And if you look up there, I have the N9020B. So this is the B revision. I've done a full review on this instrument, which you can check on my website, plus teardowns and everything. But uh, this particular unit doesn't work. But one of the reasons I, I like this one and I want to fix it is because it has the IQ inputs here on the left side. And these IQ ports are probe compatible, active probe compatible, as you can see from the connector points over here. And they can be tied directly to the baseband portion of this spectrum analyzer. This one has a 40 megahertz analysis bandwidth, and that's why it has the IQ inputs. Unfortunately, if you get the 160 megahertz bandwidth of this instrument, this doesn't fit in it anymore. So you cannot get this with 160 megahertz, which is why the MXA up there doesn't have that, even though it's a fully loaded instrument. So having said that, so what is wrong with it? Well, if you pay close attention, although it looks kind of fine over here, at the bottom over here, you can see that it says alignment failure. Now, this alignment failure means that, well, the instrument couldn't align. And there's a procedure it follows, which it uh, goes through the alignment. Now, unfortunately, when the alignment fails, it could be because of the front-end attenuator and the front-end switch. But the problem is that as soon as that fault happens, and if the instrument is in auto alignment, which I have turned off, you can see a line off up here, it's going to continue to try to do alignment ev even though it fails every single time. And it means that whatever problem it had, it's going to get that much worse because it's going to continuously run through the mechanical attenuators and really stress and strain them. So as a result, this must be completely dead if it's been left on for a long time and it doesn't work at all. But we can verify that. So here on the uh, EXG vector signal generator, I have one gigahertz zero dBm tone directly connected to the input of the instrument over here. We can enable that and we can see a tiny, tiny signal over here. I can do a peak search on it. I don't even know if I'll catch it. There it is. Yeah, it's good. So it is minus 60 dBm. Now, of course, this is not supposed to be minus 60 dBm. It's supposed to be zero dBm. So it's completely gone bad. Now, a couple of things we have to check to make sure this is not a low band, high band issue because it could be because of the, one of the mixers. But if it's one of the mixers, it might be that it works above 3.6 gigahertz, which it uses a different RF path. And I will go through the block diagram so you can see how that works. But I can go ahead and increase the frequency right now and see what we get. Let's go ahead, 2 gigahertz. You can see it's still over here. 3 gigahertz and then 4 gigahertz. And the signal is larger, but it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the attenuator is not the problem. It still might be the problem, but uh, we have to check. And once I show you the block diagram, I'll tell you the things we need to double check to make sure if this is working. And I go further, 5 and 6 gigahertz, which is the highest the EXG can go. And you can see over here, if I do a peak search on that, we see minus 34 dBm. Now, sometimes mechanical attenuators fail and they have a poor contact. And that contact behaves better at higher frequencies because it's capacitively coupled and the capacitors help pass the signal through at higher frequencies. So the low frequencies is going to have much higher attenuation. This is something we've seen in some of the other experiments I have done in the past. So yes, RF alignment failure here. I've tried running the RF alignment and indeed it uh, fails every time. But it seems to be the only error that it is generating. Uh, you can see that the only error it says RF alignment failure detected is the only error currently present. So, so far, I think, but well, what else we can do is besides the taking it apart, let's look at the block diagram so I can tell you a little bit about the instrument and then open it up, see what it looks like. So let's familiarize ourselves with a block diagram of the MXA. This will help us to see where the problem most likely is. Even though intuitively, we can kind of tell that the problem is probably in the front end, attenuator and switches. But nonetheless, let's take a look here. So this is the block diagram with the highlighted path for input signals below 3.6 gigahertz. This is showing you what happens to signals that are below a certain frequency because we have multiple conversion stages and various harmonic mixers. And it has to reroute the signal through the different filters for whichever frequency range it's going to be operating. Otherwise, you're going to have very bad performance. I've talked about this in detail in some, several of the other videos that I've done and repairs that I have done in the past. So we should probably turn our attention to this front end section and see what kind of circuits are there. So let me zoom in here because this is a fairly large block diagram. There we go. So now if you look in the front, we have an A9 input attenuator followed by an A10 input attenuator. And the difference between them is that the A9 input attenuator gives you very limited range. It's got only two 2 dB attenuations in there, but it does perform one additional very important function. 
it does have a path for the calibration signal to be injected at the front end of the instrument. So the way this works is that a signal of about 28 and minus 25 dBm, either at 50 megahertz or 4.8 gigahertz, can be injected directly into this path. Now once you do this, you can actually use this signal because its amplitude and its frequency is very well controlled. You can use that to calibrate the remaining conversion stages, amplifiers, attenuators, and so on of the unit. That's why this calibration signal is so critical. So when alignment fails, one of the possibilities is that the calibration signal simply isn't reaching the, the um, circuits following the attenuators. Now, after the first input attenuator, you have the main attenuator, which has 70 dB of range. 6 dB is the first step in there. So 2 dB, 2 dB, and 6 dB gives you very nice 2 dB per step attenuation mechanically, which is excellent. And these mechanical attenuators are supposed to have very good re uh, repetition, very good repeatability and accuracy. But of course, they have limited age because of the mechanical nature of them. And then after that, we can see the signal going down in this direction. We have a uh, low pass filter of 4 gigahertz because this path is highlighted for frequencies below 3.6 gigahertz. And then we see our first mixer, which actually upconverts and so on. So let's not worry about any of that right now. Let's just turn on attention here. Now, another possibility is that the calibration signal itself is missing, that somehow it's not making it to the circuit itself which means that something else is faulty. So we have to find this J connector, which is from the build A16. The block A16 is where this is being generated. So we can go ahead and try and find that by going down the list. Here we go. This is now the path highlighted for signals between 3.6 and 13.6 gigahertz. You can see that this entire section at the bottom is bypassed because we don't do the first up conversion anymore. We can just directly use uh, the second batch of the mixers to convert that. So it has three converters. We ignore the first one when the signals are above 3.6 gigahertz. So that's all nice and fancy. Uh, this is for the 26 and a half gigahertz version. And here it is, there it is. This is our A16 reference generator. Let's go ahead and zoom into that a little bit better. I'm sorry about that. This is, it's, it's really quite amazing how bad Adobe is at, at making it easy to annotate and uh, use PDFs like this is pretty bad. So here it is. Here's a connector, connector J, uh, J to going to the block A9, which was the front end attenuator. And if you look carefully here, it becomes very clear. Here's our 50 megahertz calibration. You can see that goes into this Cal combiner block. And here's the 48 meg 4800 megahertz going into the same Cal combiner. So this block over here allows the instrument to select which of these two signals is being passed on to the front end attenuator. And exactly as you can see, this is being generated from here. It even has an ALC, so you can make sure that the amplitude of the 50 megahertz signal is exactly what it's supposed to be. This is very important because we're using this amplitude for calibration so it has to be exactly minus 25 dBm that's why it has its own ALC um, block over here and it's just generated from this 100 megahertz divided by two path here so it's all nice and clear the 4800 has its own ALC as well again very important without this ALC you cannot use this for calibration which is generated by a DRO uh, which is in a loop back in the PLL architecture so all of that is quite nice. I think it makes sense now to go back to the instrument, take it apart and examine the signal coming from this port, make sure it's there. And then of course, go back to the front end and take these attenuators and take a look at them and see what's going on with them. When these things fail, you can't necessarily fix them, but nonetheless, it should be educational for us to take it apart and find out what has happened to them. All right. So everything's being done under the supervision of Pooch, of course, who loves to sit there on top of the seven and a half digit multimeter from Keysight. And then let's go back down here. So I've taken the top cover off of this instrument and now we have to now just remove these protective shields. Now these instruments are all going to have shields like this, of course, because there's so much EM that you have to cover and protect from each other. So I've taken the screws off of this one. There you go, that looks pretty nice. Those are all the different boards in there that we can see this, each of these boards perform a different function and then we can identify them as we start looking deeper into the instrument. And now if I take this one off as well, there we go, oh, that's a lot of RF cages. Yeah, so it's interesting that they have chosen to do this uh, using many RF cages individually as opposed to sandwiching it between two of the cast metal pieces like they do, with, let's say with this, uh, this one over here, but I guess that just works out for them to be cheaper. So this board has 
LO coming in and out of it, so obviously synthesizer related as 10 megahertz crystals over here. This is most likely the DRO with a screw for adjustment, and which is glued, so because it's already been calibrated. Interesting marking you can see on all these connectors because as they connect the cables, they have a check mark and they check them off as they assemble it. So now if I look over here, on the left side, I will see the front end attenuators. I'm gonna slide this over here. There is our front end attenuators. Here's the switch and here's the main attenuator. This is the, two, the 4 dB and the 70 dB. And you can see they're all connected with rigid coax cables. Now it's very hard to see on camera and it's quite difficult to take this out. But if I were to follow this, let me show you. So this one, this connector over here is connected to the front panel. So that's where we inject RF in. This one right underneath it is going to be the calibration signal. That's what we are interested in that I have to follow and see where it goes. At the bottom there, the output of this one then twists around and goes into this one, which then has this output going back onto the first converter, which is right underneath here, which is very difficult to see. I wonder how easy it is to take these attenuators out. Okay, I think I have detected it now. So there it is. So this one coming from here, it goes into this one right here. And this one then follows over here, which then goes into right there. So this port over here is, is even referenced here. It's referenced as Cal out, which is what we would expect. So we'd have to remove this somehow. This is going to be unfortunately a little difficult. It's probably easier to do it on that side rather than this side because I have no room to take this coax out without taking this whole board out, which is probably going to take quite some time. Given, the, the, given that it has so many things connected to it. So perhaps it's easier to uh, look at it from the attenuator side. And of course, Pooch has uh, completed his tasks, so he's taking a break. Aren't you, Pooch? You know you're sitting on my anti-static towel. Uh, it's not really anti-static. Good, Pooch. All right, this is a much better look at this front end here. Obviously, this thing had a plate on the left side that I could have removed. These key side guys know how to put these things together for servicing, of course, because these things can go bad uh, over time. So here on the left, you can see we have two uh, mechanical switches here, so many connectors going in and out of them, and that's to be expected. This is a Yig tuned filter, I believe, and the first converter is right underneath there. So it all makes sense from this uh, part of the circuit based on the block diagram we looked at. Now here's our first itinerary, second itinerary that we were looking at from the top. Now we're looking at the side. Here's the main RF input in this coax going in with the copper uh, ground on the outside. Very high quality cables. These are rigid extremely low loss and very repeatable phase stable of course they're rigid and then the input goes into here and here's our calibration signal you can see that it, it therefore this switch can switch between these two ports and we trace that and we know where it's coming from the output of the itinerary then loops around into this one and then the output of that then goes down into the first converter so it all makes sense now that we have access to it, I can remove this and look at it on the other spectrum analyzer and look at the signal integrity there. We can also do other things. We can separate the attenuators. We can look at the signal from one on the spectrum analyzer. We have every tool necessary to do a complete characterization of this front end with the instruments that we have in the lab. And therefore, we can find out exactly what has gone wrong and which of this is working and which is not working. Is it a mechanical problem? Is it an electrical control problem? This cable controls the two attenuators, goes into the attenuator controller over there. I'm excited to try it out. Let's keep going. So the first step, we're going to take a look at the calibration signal. So we have connected it to this blue coax, and that is going directly to the MXA B. So I'm going to be able to enable that so we can take a look. As I mentioned, there are two calibration signal, 50 megahertz and 4.8 gigahertz, and we can verify that they're both there. So let's look at the MXA. So let's start with the 50 megahertz. I'm going to enable this. And let's enable the 50 megahertz input. And there it is, there's our calibration signal. Amplitude is minus 25 dBm, which is exactly what it should be. So at least we know that the 50 megahertz signal is present. So let's go ahead and turn this off. I'm going to set the instrument now to 4.8 gigahertz instead. So center frequency, let's get that to 4.8 gigahertz. And then I'm going to enable the 4.8 gigahertz signal and see if we see that too. There you go, that's pretty good. Now this one is obviously going to have a slightly different amplitude. This is supposed to be minus 28 dBm, but it's minus 30. But of course I have that long SMA cable connected to the input, so we're going to lose a lot more signal at 4.8 gigahertz than we do at 50 megahertz. So that's to be ex expected. It's nice and stable, and if this was moving around, we would most likely see a PLL unlock error on the MXA, and we don't. 
which means that uh, it's very likely that the issue is simply is not the calibration signal as I anticipated is probably attenuators. So let's go ahead and rewire and actually use our synthesizer here and inject a signal into the various stages of the attenuation and see which of them is faulty and then we can take the next step. Okay, so now we're wired in for only the front end attenuator and calibrator switch. So the calibration signal is back into the attenuator, the front input is going to the switch attenuator as well and I'm taking the output of that directly to the spectrum analyzer, completely bypassing the 70 dB variable attenuator that's after it. So now we can identify if the problem is in this or in this or maybe even in both. So we can identify this one and I have the outputs and the inputs are all connected. The input of the instrument is connected directly to the AXG so I can inject the tone into the unit and I can look at the output directly on the MXA. Okay, so I have tuned the spectrum analyzer down to 50 megahertz. This would allow us to make sure that the signals are getting through. The problem with testing at 4.8 gigahertz, as I've mentioned earlier, is that capacitive coupling and, and poor ohmic contact can be masked, and we don't want that. But at 50 megahertz, that will become much more clear. So right now, e EXG is set to 55 megahertz, and attenuation is set to 0 dB, the front attenuator, and the calibration signal is turned off. So of course, we see nothing. But let me go ahead and turn the input on. And there's our input, and not too bad, it's at minus 10 dBm, we can see minus 10 dBm here. So with 0 dB attenuation, this seems to be working just fine. The forward path is there. Let me turn this off, and I'm going to turn the calibration signal on now, the 50 MHz calibration signal. And there's our 50 MHz calibration signal, minus 25 dBm. So that's also correct. So, so far things are okay. So let me turn this back off again, and go ahead and turn this back on. And let's try and apply a 2 dB attenuation. Remember this front end has only two 2 dB attenuations, so we should get at most 4 dB. So let's go ahead and turn the attenuation to 2 dB. I can do that by entering the attenuation level manually. So here's 2 dB. Whoa, that's bad. There you go, we're getting minus 55. So yes, the front end attenuator is not working. As soon as the 2 dB is kicked in, we're down to minus 55. So no wonder we cannot do any alignment. Uh, now let me do instead of 2 dB, 4 dB, and it's completely gone. Yeah, so that's not going to work. So something is wrong with the front end attenuator. So that switch is definitely broken. So now the question is, is the attenuator that follows it also broken or not? Which means that we have to do a little bit of rerouting. So instead of routing to this one, now we're going to route directly to this. So we have to actually remove this cable and inject our signal in here and then monitor the signal coming out of there then we can test the 70 dB attenuator. If that one's also broken, then we have a big problem because we have to check to see uh, if we can find a replacement or if we can perhaps repair them. So let's check the second one too. Okay, and here's the next test to check this attenuator, input and output, similar fashion, injecting signal in here, looking at the signal coming out, and we're going to switch this attenuator through all the stages and check the output. Okay, let's take a look at the signal. Now remember that we no longer have the calibration signal because it's not in the signal path anymore. We only can do what we inject into the attenuator manually ourselves. So let's inject the 50 megahertz or the 55 megahertz signal once again. There it is, and it looks good. It's at minus 10 dBm, and I'm, that's what I'm injecting. So with zero dB attenuation, the attenuator is forwarding the signal quite nicely. So let me go ahead and now try the different stages of that attenuator. Now remember from the block diagram that this attenuator can do uh, 6 dB, 10 dB, 20 dB, and 30 dB. Those are the four distinct attenuation paths that are in there. So we can check every stage. Everything else is a combination of those attenuations. Let's start with 6 dB. Here's 6 dB. Excellent, that looks great. That's minus 16. So the 6 dB pad is working. Let's try 10 dB. Excellent, 10 dB is working as well. 20 dB. Beautiful, that's working. And 30 dB. Come on, perfect, look at that, that's the 30 dB down, so that's 10 minus 30 is minus 40. So it looks like the attenuator at least individually is okay. So let's do some combinations. So if I want 16 dB of attenuation, I should be able to enter that in. So 16 dB, there we go, that's perfect, that's a combination of 10 and 6. And if I want to see uh, 30, if I want to see 40, I can enter 40 dB attenuation. Perfect, it's working quite nicely. So you can see it's most likely the second itinerary is probably okay. I can do 26 dB, for example, a combination again. Perfect. So this is a really good news because it means the second attenuator is alive. And of course, the less we need to fiddle around with, the better it is. And there you go, which is monitoring our progress again. So it looks good. So that means that this is the only thing that's actually bad. This itinerary is working. So let's take it out of the unit 
take it apart and take a look inside of it. Normally this is not repairable, but I think taking it apart would be fun and we can see what's happened to the pads that's causing this problem. Maybe we can clean them, maybe we can figure a way to fix it. Either way, looking inside it would be worthwhile. I've never taken one of these apart on camera that has three inputs. I've taken one of these apart so you've seen that, but you've never seen this one. So this should be quite educational. So we have seen these attenuator switches before. This one just has the extra calibration input. And I've taken some of these apart as well. Now these are electromechanical devices. We can see that we have these solenoids here that push a rod in and out that switches the switches depending on which one, which path you want to take. And once I take it apart completely, we will be able to examine the contacts. Now the problem is not with these switches because we know that we can switch things in and out. So the solenoids are most likely all functional. The issue is somehow the contact between the attenuators and the through path and the selection path are not working. So I've taken most of the screws off. Now you have to be very careful with these because they're quite fragile. Now this is also obviously already dead, but nonetheless, I mean, there's one screw left here. Let's take this screw off and see if we can see anything meaningful underneath these uh, contacts. Let me see if I can remove this. Uh, no, this screw is still connected. There we go. That's nice. So we can see the, the connections and here is the ceramic pieces that have, oh, that's bad. That's completely discolored. It kind of look, almost looks like there's moisture that has gone inside here. But that is uh, interesting. So we have to look at this really under the microscope. So let's look at different sections of this attenuator here under the microscope. So we know that it has to have at least two 2 dB attenuator sections there and there is another piece here which I just found and this looks like an AC block and it looks like that you can uh, switch this in perhaps when the input is selected so that you have a decoupling between the RF input and the rest of the circuit and uh, of course then uh, when you have the through path of the calibration going you don't need this so this is probably only switched in when the input is selected. Now this is almost certainly works because as you know, when the attenuation was set to zero and we were measuring it, this circuit was working. So only when the 2 dB attenuation sections were selected, we had a fault. But the structure is fairly nice. You can see many, many wire bonds here all in parallel. This is to emulate a perfect plane going across and maintain as well a coplanar waveguide structure as possible. These lines that you see here and here are the result of the impact of the blades onto this as the attenuation gets switched in and out and the calibration and input uh, RF gets selected. So this is normal and these scratches in fact are necessary to create a good contact as oxidization builds up. Nice grounding clamps on both sides, again maintaining a good coplanar structure there. And underneath this, even though you cannot see it, there are RF absorbers and that prevents building of any kind of standing wave and reflections and other modes of propagation within the attenuator structure. So this is very important and this is common. These absorbers, as, you, as we have seen and I've shown you in other circuits, are present in many places. So let's go ahead and look at the one of the 2 dB sections. We go past, here you go, this is an attenuator, you can see, uh, sorry, the RF absorber, you can see underneath it. And here's our first uh, 2 dB attenuator. Now let me get this in focus, and as you can see, it doesn't look very good. I'm not quite sure what has happened here, but it looks like the resistive portion of the attenuator is completely disconnected. And this explains why at higher frequency we were seeing less attenuation, and this is just basically coupling across. There's a resistor over here, and this resistor in combination with this resistor accomplishes two tasks. One, it does resistive division to give you the 2 dB attenuation. Now, 2 dB is very little, that's why you don't need a very large resistor on this side. And at the same time, uh, you're going to get a 50 ohm characteristic impedance maintained through a 2 dB attenuation. Because remember, this has to be a 50 ohm in 50 ohm app. Similar structure, coplanar, you can see the impact of these things on both sides, so it all kind of makes sense. Now let's go and see, so this one is not working and then we saw that no matter what I selected, 2 dB or 4 dB, we had a lot of loss. So even between 2 to 4 dB, we weren't getting the proper 2 dB difference. So it looks like both of the 2 dB attenuators are bad. So let me flip this over and go to the other portion, other section, to see the other 2 dB attenuator. There you go, there's the other one. Now this one looks a lot nicer in terms of other resistors, but of course there is a crack in it, you can see it has cracked right down the middle, which means that there is an open uh, electrical open here in the middle and that explains again why we see so much attenuation uh, when we switch in this. So unfortunately, both 2 dB pads are dead and I don't think I can source these ceramics from anywhere 
I am looking on eBay to buy a broken attenuator and perhaps salvage these. Hopefully they are working. And maybe if the relays are dead, but the ceramic attenuator sections are still working, I can recover that. But again, no, I'll ask this. I have to look for it and see if I can find something like this. Unfortunately, this is not repairable. It's not an issue of just cleaning it. So we're going to have to wait and see uh, if I can find a replacement. Well, for the time being, we're kind of stuck. Now, it's most likely that this unit doesn't have any other issues except for that, but we don't know that until we completely test it. It's a little difficult to test it otherwise because it relies on that initial calibration. And once it doesn't, and uh, once it's not able to do that, then the other signals are just going to be kind of meaningless. But having said that, uh, I'm going to let this uh, go online so that at least you guys can watch the video, and then I will make an update on it, and then we will do some more measurements. Especially, I want to show you uh, what the implications are of having the baseband inputs in the front of the instrument. There's some interesting experiments we can do with those ports once we have the unit up and running. So we will definitely have a second part on it once I manage to get a hold of it. So I'm going to leave it to you guys in the comment section. Let me know if you know a source where I can get those uh, ceramics or if an attenuator that you know I can buy for a reasonable price. Let me know and I will go ahead and do that. And thank you for my Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome. You're the reason why we can do this. This is because of you guys. And of course, there has been one scope giveaway and there is another one that's going right now. I will select the winner for that. And there's going to be lots of other really interesting giveaways in the future. So make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss them. And I'll see you in the comment section.